Thank you for joining us. You are a part of an elite group who recognizes that black women's health should be at the forefront of the national conversation. We are mothers, daughters, activists, entrepreneurs, entertainers, corporate warriors, and more, who help boost the economy and often drive the national conversation. For 38 years, the Black Women's Health Imperative has strived to amplify our voices, help enact policy that protects us, research our issues, create programs that enhance our lives, and produce events like this one to ensure we keep the conversation going about the issues that matter to us most. So, let's get started with our program. And good afternoon. I'm Leslie Foster. I will be your moderator this afternoon. And I'm very excited on behalf of the Black Women's Health Imperative and our partner, Healthy Women, to launch back into this conversation about reclaiming your wellness, particularly around the issue of obesity. This campaign was devised to raise awareness of obesity and really to have an honest conversation that is free from stigma, or bias and judgment. And today, our topic is understanding mental health and the obesity factor. And we are commemorating the B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Health Awareness Month here in July. Back in 2008, the U.S. House of Representatives made this designation in order to highlight the importance of this issue around advocating for underserved groups to have early access to care uh, around quality mental health care. And so we're looking at this obesity connection. We're looking into it as a chronic disease uh, because we know that obesity is associated with diabetes, with cardiovascular disease, with cancers, and with poor mental health. So let's talk about how many people are impacted. Over 100 million adults, adolescents, and children are living with obesity, including 30% of Medicare beneficiaries, but beneficiaries, but the prevalence is highest among Black and Hispanic communities, and the numbers are staggering. And every time I read this statistic, it is just so jarring. Nearly 50% of non-Hispanic Black adults and 45% of Hispanic adults are living with obesity. Sit with that for just a moment. On top of that, four out of every five Black women is either living with obesity or considered overweight. And then when you couple that with research that suggests that the adult Black community is 20% more likely than the rest of the population to experience serious mental health problems, such as major depressive disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, and 16% of Hispanics report having a mental health condition, you can easily see why we need to make these connections and understand them. Because in both the Black and the Hispanic communities, only 34% of people who really need mental health treatment are receiving it. And there are many reasons for that. And stigma is just one. So that's why we have convened this stellar panel of medical experts to talk with us this afternoon. They're going to take us deeper into the issue, into the underlying aspects of coping with mental health issues while living with obesity. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Novo Nordisk, for their continued support in addressing these pressing issues, which are, of course, increasingly plaguing our communities. Now, before I bring on our full panel, I thought it might be interesting to hear from our first panelist, Dr. Christine Crawford. She's an associate medical director and a member of the senior leadership team for what we call NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Thank you so much for taking the time, Dr. Crawford, to spend with us this afternoon. Can we talk about the organization that you represent and the significance of the B.B. Moore Campbell Minority Mental Health Awareness Month? I think some of the women joining us today certainly may know about B.B. Moore Campbell and her prolific writing, but they may not understand her connection to advocacy around equity and mental health. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited about having this opportunity to talk about the connection between physical health and your mental health. And to do that during this month of July, um, B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority um, Health Awareness Month. And talking about this now, my hope is that 
some of the statistics that you had shared earlier on about how obesity really impacts black and brown communities. My hope is that people will take this information that they'll learn today to empower themselves to improve their lives, as well as to provide tools and resources for other family members and friends who are in their lives so that they can be on this journey towards wellness. Now, a little bit about NAMI and who we are. So we're the last, largest grassroots organization that's dedicated to improving the health and well-being of individuals living with a mental health condition, as well as the friends and family members who support them. And so we're really built on people who have lived experience with mental health concerns and empowering them through education, knowledge, and support so that they can live their best lives and to thrive. Um, now, B.B. Moore was one of those um, um, amazing individuals who was actively a part of NAMI and actually started um, one of our chapters out in NAMI LA County, um, Ingleside, um, which was really driven and motivated by her determination to eliminate stigma that was associated with mental health conditions within the Black community. And really thinking about her daughter who was experiencing some mental health concerns and about supports and reducing stigma stigma around those supports so that people can get the help that they need. And so it's important for us to talk about mental health, to know that there are supports and resources available, and also that NAMI is working towards raising awareness about the connection between mental health and physical health. All important things to talk about, not just in July, but all year round. Let me bring in the rest of our panel. First, we've got Dr. Yolandra Hancock. She's the founder and CEO of Delta Health and Wellness Consulting. And we also have Dr. Tiffany Bell Washington to round out our dynamic panel. She's a diplomat for the American Board of Obesity Medicine and diplomat American Board of Lifestyle Medicine. Thank you all for being here today. And Dr. Bell Washington, I'm going to start with you. Um, I think a, a great place to talk about, uh, to, to sort of launch here so that we're all on the same page is kind of talk to us about what is obesity? We heard Dr. Crawford talk about obesity and mental health, but some people may need a more refined definition. So let's talk about what is obesity and why it's classified as a chronic disease and why that is important. Thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, I just wanted to point out that I'm an obesity medicine doctor, but I'm also a psychiatrist. So I'm very happy to be here to talk about both of these things. Um, essentially, obesity, uh, just in layman's terms, is a complex chronic illness that involves the storage of body fat. Um, and, you know, it's very, um, it's, it's complicated. Uh, and people often think that it possibly is just a cosmetic concern, which is not true. Um, when we're talking about obesity, we're speaking more on the lines of your health, um, ways that we can eliminate the over 200 diseases that are um, attributed to body fat and obesity. Um, and we're not talking so much about how you're going to fit into your skinny jeans or, or maybe your next bikini. Um, even though those things may be important, that's not our main focus. Um, so I wanted to point out that typically when people hear the word obesity, they become very um, alarmed, they get upset. And it's just important to realize it is a disease. It's not a label. So you shouldn't call people obese. You shouldn't um, use stigmatizing words. But the truth is that obesity is a disease. And oftentimes, you can't get the treatments you need without that diagnosis. So if your doctor has labeled that for you, just um, try not to be offended and look at it as a, as a growing point, a way to move forward. Um, so it's important. In 2013, American Medical Association um, decided that obesity was a disease. And here we are still trying to convince people, including doctors and the general public, um, that it's important. And it's something that we need to uh, really take seriously. We often think, and you're, you're talking, alluding to this, about behavior that contributes to living with obesity. And I, I like the fact that you're talking about language here, because even that is a shift for people. And changing the way that we look at the personhood of people who may be on this journey. And Dr. Hancock, we know that diet and exercise and lifestyle are not the only things that can be contributors to living with obesity. There are also other things called social determinants of health. And we hear that term quite a bit. 
I wonder if you can help people understand how living with obesity is broader than just what people may think. Absolutely. I think that's very critical for us in general to understand, but particularly the lay public and healthcare providers. We often consider obesity, the condition of obesity, to be what some physicians I have worked with called a hand to mouth disease, meaning that simply mm -hmm. it's you overeat and you don't exercise. Not only is that a ridiculous oversimplification, but it's also belittling. A good number of my patients don't eat any more than I do. They may exercise almost at the same level that I do, but for a lot of for a variety of reasons, it makes it more challenging for them to be able to lose weight. When we specifically talk about the social determinants of health, those are the factors where we are born, live, grow, learn, live, play, and age and work that inter connect to influence our health outcomes. They make up about 80% of our health. Access to this phenomenal panel of physicians is about 20% of our health outcomes. And these social uh, determinants include things like our level of education, our employment status, our income, housing. Your house may be great, but the built environment in which your house exists, the resources that are available to you in terms of transportation, healthy food choice, safe space for physical activity. It, we've classically defined race as a social determinant of health. I would argue, as I'm sure the other panelists would, that more importantly, racism is a very critical mm. factor in terms of social determinants of health because racism not only impacts us directly because of micro and macro aggressions, particularly for people of color that we experience every single day, but racism also influences another social determinant, policy. And on this primary election day here in the state of Maryland where I am, it's even more critically important that people understand just how powerful policy is as a social determinant of health. Policy defines what kind of house I live in, what neighborhood I um, live in, the level of crime and violence I'm exposed to, the kind of food options that I have available to me because zoning laws are defined based on policy. I always say that health is in all policy. There's a potential for racism to also show up in all of these policies. And so we as individuals make our food choices, our physical activity choices, everything about our health is influenced by the environment in which we live. And so it's important for us collectively to understand that a person dealing with obesity may have tried all that they could to achieve weight loss, but because of one biophysical components within the body that keep us where we are, but even more importantly, the environmental factors that influence our ability to make those healthy choices. And then the racism and policy influences that facilitate chronic stress that I'm sure we'll talk about later. All of those are factors that directly and indirectly influence a person's risk of developing obesity and whether or not they're successful in losing weight. And you mentioned all of that, and that's even before you add a pandemic into the mix. And that has even exacerbated the chasm that uh, around disparities in black and brown communities, which all of you know, because you have touchstones to it every day in your work. I want to come back to you, Dr. Crawford, because uh, we know that living with obesity can impact your whole body. It can impact your mental health. And I'm wondering during this period of minority mental health awareness during this month, how are you addressing this issue specific to people of color and the kinds of stress and the kinds of racism and the kinds of other exposures we have that all come together to make our lived experience and potentially living with obesity and intersectionality. Yeah, and so what we know is that there are a number of factors that people experienced and were exposed to throughout the pandemic that had a direct impact on their overall physical and mental health. And a lot of it really stemmed from the fact that people experienced trauma in a variety of different ways. They experienced the trauma of losing a loved one, a friend, a family member because of the virus itself. They experienced the trauma associated with the loss of a sense of normalcy and being able to predict the future. And so all of that trauma on top of 
the trauma that was related to this reckoning around racism that really emerged in 2020 um, in response to the George Floyd incident. And so racism has always been present, but the fact that it was on such huge display and everyone was talking about it and we were seeing images repeatedly of black people being subjected to discrimination, being subjected to violence and experiencing death at the hands of racism was additional trauma that was difficult for a lot of people to turn their head away from and to run away from. And so having all of that superimposed with maybe already being vulnerable to experiencing depression and anxiety and not having access to some of the tools and effective coping strategies and outlets to be able to manage with all of those complex emotions. So for a lot of people engaging in physical activity, being able to, to go outside to gain access to healthy foods and to be able to prepare the foods with the time that is necessary in order to prepare healthy and nutritious foods. Because people were experiencing these losses, these traumas, it was really hard to keep up with the lifestyle um, um, changes that are necessary in order to kind of maintain um, a certain weight. And so what we have been doing at NAMI is we've been talking about the role that racism and trauma has played on physical and mental health and to label that and to acknowledge that and to validate the experiences of so many black and brown people who have been going through that and wondering, am I the only one who's been struggling with these issues? But we're here to say as part of NAMI, you are not alone in that. And in fact, that's our go-to slogan um, at NAMI is to let people know that they are not alone. So through our support groups that we've been offering at our various local chapters, through our educational workshops in which we've been talking about the role of racism and trauma, and talking about that openly and honestly, and to see that coming from the top of our leadership, our CEO, who really stands behind the impact that racism has on physical and mental health. And the other thing that I just want to mention is that we at NAMI have what's referred to as um, uh, Hearts and Minds, which is a program that has been developed to really talk about the connection between physical and mental health, the importance of physical activity, the importance of a nutritious, um, healthy lifestyle in terms of your diet, and also talking about the impact that mental health conditions and the treatments that we provide can make, um, how it could contribute to making it a little bit more challenging for people. Um, so certainly NAMI has been doing its best to um, address this issue that you brought up. Can we go a little more granular, Dr. Bell Washington, and help people understand what are the things they might be feeling that might be red flags where they should be saying to themselves, I need to reach out for some help right now? Awesome. Um, again, I'm very glad we're speaking about this. I will say, um, Overall, it seems that our population, my family, you know, just everyone included, does not necessarily admit when they're having any um, sort of mental health struggles or troubles. And, you know, I have lots of patients because I mentioned I'm a psychiatrist. Um, so child and adolescent psychiatrist, adult psychiatrist. And when people come to me, um, often the first thing they want to tell me is, well, I'm not crazy. So, you know, and they're very scared to talk to a psychiatrist because they're concerned that, uh, we're going to think something of them. So I always reassure them that, you know, one, no, no one should be calling you crazy. No one should think you're crazy. Uh, we all have something that we're working on in life and they're, they're just struggles and that's just how life goes. So you get to a struggle and you try to surmount it. Um, so um, we have to be careful when I label someone as de depressed or if I say they're having anxiety, because a lot of times they'll say, no, I, I don't have that. I'm not sad. I'm not crying. Mm -hmm. um, and so your depression may not look like um, someone sitting in a corner kind of balled up, not willing to get out of bed, because for a lot of black women, we've been taught to be strong, keep pushing, don't show your emotions at work because it might be misunderstood as aggression or um, someone may think that you have some other emotional issues. So, you know, people really hold it um, close to the chest and, and they don't necessarily share. So I would say 
if, um, and I, I use this term with my, my um, teen patients, but if you're feeling some kind of way or you just notice that you're waking up and you're um, kind of thinking, oh, I just, I don't think I can get through this day. You know, how am I going to get to work and do the things I need to do? If, if you are getting up and getting things done, but at the end of the day, you're so drained, so um, just hopeless, kind of feeling like I can't go on. Um, Lord, I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And that just is a feeling that keeps overwhelming you. I think that's the time to reach out. Uh, NAMI is an excellent resource. Um, I am on the executive board of Black Psychiatrists of America. So if you go to our website, um, I'm not being paid for this, but you know, just um, if you go to their website, there's ways to find Black psychiatrists if that's something that's important to you. But most of all, you want to find someone who is culturally um, inclusive and sensitive and, and can hear you when you're saying, you know, I feel like that comment was racist that I heard earlier at work, you know, how do I handle that? And sometimes people will say, oh, you're being too sensitive. So I would say if you, um, anxiety for a lot of people is um, being very worried, uh, just kind of always thinking about what's the next bad thing that may happen? When will the other shoe drop? Um, feeling that you have chest pain and, you know, you've been checked out and there's really nothing going on, um, you know, in terms of like a heart attack or something, but you keep having chest pain, you keep having trouble sleeping, um, you're having upset stomach. Those are things I would look for um, in terms of anxiety. And then just um, if you keep getting a feeling that uh, you need help, I think we should just admit that and say it's okay everyone needs help and then seek seek treatment so those are some of the things i tend to look for but i would say we have to be careful as pro providers and physicians um, that we don't just label someone depressed because we give out a, um, a checklist at the beginning of the appointment and a lot of people write zero right down the um the line because mm -hmm. yeah, they don't want it on their you know permanent record they don't want it to be there that they maybe felt this way so just um approaching it with sensitivity is important and then on our the patient side being willing to admit if you are having difficulties dr hancock you treat many people of color and um, people who may have your shared life experience. And I know that uh, Dr. Bell Washington talked about um, an inclusive strategy and you, you do things like Reiki to help your patients as well. Um, is some of this though, uh, some of it's on us to identify, but some of it is also on the people who touch our lives as providers to help us recognize, right? So how do you have that kind of conversation with your patients, that kind of sensitive understanding conversation to help them understand. And, and I'm asking you this because there may be people who um, have not had this conversation with their physicians. And there may be physicians who haven't had this conversation with their patients. So we want to help educate everybody on the spectrum about how we get people to better better help. Sure. sure. You know, the, there's no more sensitive space than being a pediatrician and talking to a little one about weight. That's where you really want to bring in your least stigmatizing, most culturally competent self. Because the last thing I would want to do, both as a pediatrician and even more importantly, as a mother, is create a conversation, create a space where a child feels belittled, feel stigmatized, feels uncomfortable. So I'll talk through what I do for kids and then I'll talk about what I do for adults. In the pediatric space, children aren't always coming to see me because they're dealing with obesity. They're coming for a checkup. It just may happen that while I'm evaluating them, they may be also diagnosed with obesity. And so the conversation that I have with parents, I use the few tools we have to talk about weight, which is the growth chart. We go through their weight and I show them their weight and I say, okay, my love, he's at this percentile. We talk through what that percentile means. And then I look at their height. And after I do that, we talk through based on his weight and height and age, he is this much above where he should be, or he's at average weight for a 12 year old and he's six. Mm -hmm. Have you had any conversations before about his growth? And the parents will either say yes or no. And then I'll talk to my patient because they're here to see me. And I said, my love, especially if they've been brought in because of their weight, I will ask them specifically, do you understand why mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa have brought you in? And they'll either say yes or no. And if they say yes, I'll ask them, how do you feel about them bringing you in about your weight? And they are, children are so beautifully honest. They'll let me know. 
I don't like it because I feel fine. So instead of talking about weight, we talk about health habits. Every one of us have health habits that we can improve. And this is what I do for my grownups as well. Because I'm a pediatrician, I call them my grownups. So we talk through what are the ways in which we know to be healthy. I will ask a child and they will tell you sleeping, eating right, exercise, not too much TV, et cetera. So then I ask them, well, where are you with that? How much TV do you watch? I watch six hours. Well, you know us pediatricians say no more than two hours because if we're watching mm -hmm. so much TV, we can't exercise. Talk to me. How do you feel about physical activity? Because if you say exercise, it reminds them of PE, right? So right. physical activity, running, dancing, playing, extra gaming. Like you can be on your gaming system and still get it in. Like I caught an asthma attack doing a boxing game playing with my little brother. <laughs> <laughs> so there are ways to really speak to where they are. For grownups, it's the same thing. We also go through, I screen everyone for depression and anxiety, whether they're coming in for their two-year-old well child checkup or their eight-year-old obesity check-in. Because mm -hmm. I want to make sure everyone is okay. The same thing with grownups. We talk about all of the health habits, sleep, stress, your sources of stress. And then from there, talk about how do we address each of those things. Weight is probably one of the last pieces of conversation we talk about. Now, the patients will ask, how much weight do you think I'm going to lose? And I say, my love, Rome was not built in a day. Weight is not going to drop overnight. This is about your health, focusing on all aspects of your health, inclusive of your mental health. And we will talk through those issues as well. And because children don't often share when they've been bullied, when they have um, felt some kind of way to Dr. Bell Washington's point about their weight, we also talk about that and particularly for my teen patients, we talk about the influence of social media and how that feels for them. And then for the adults, I talk about what are the spaces in which they're making these decisions. What does your neighborhood look like? Is your money funny? What do we need to do to support you in all of those aspects in order for you to achieve better health? And by way of that, your blood pressure will come down, your blood sugar will come down, your weight will come down cortisol will come down we talk about stress related to racism recently we just heard about the sesame street uh spice and and that whole thing with the little girls potentially mm -hmm. being shunned it took me back to when i was little having those same experiences so i had a little bit of cortisol release when that happened mm -hmm. and then we talk through when those stressors happen what ends up as the result do i go to food do I go to watching TV? What are the self-medicating measures that we put in place? Because this isn't just Johnny wanting a pack of cookies. This mm -hmm. is him having a very hard day, needing something to comfort him. And he has found that in this double layer cookie. So perhaps instead of that, we figure out what are some other ways in which we can navigate him around it so that we provide a very comprehensive approach, not just to obesity and mental health, but comprehensive health. Let's talk about the role of, of drugs and how they can be helpful in addressing mental health issues and people living with obesity. Dr. Crawford, I, I have to ask you this because we know that some of those drugs could also have an impact on people living with obesity. Um, can we talk about that a little bit? Because I think there are some people who are nervous about seeking out other options around that for that very reason. Yes, the concern is valid. You know, there are a number of the medication options that we provide our patients that have the side effect of weight gain, as well as some other potential consequences that can impact overall physical health, having to do with the impact on their blood sugar level, on the amount of cholesterol that they have um, floating around in their blood. And so, yes, our medications do have those side effects. Oftentimes that can create a huge barrier for people to be willing to engage in any sort of discussion. But I see it as striking that fine balance between achieving stability with regards to your mood, while also being mindful of some of the side effects that can come along with our medication. Oftentimes people say, no thank you, no thanks at all, or if they happen to start a medicine and they may gain some weight, they may abruptly stop it and say, no medications ever again, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And that's why I really encourage people to have ongoing regular conversations with their 
medication prescriber, whether that be a doctor, a psychiatric NP, a nurse practitioner, your primary care provider, and let them know how the medication has been impacting your overall physical health. Because sometimes it could be a matter of adjusting the dose, lowering the dose that you're on so it doesn't have as many side effects with regards to weight gain and other aspects of your physical health, or there may be an option to switch to another medication. And we have a long list of potential medications that are available, and it's all about finding that right fix. But I don't want people who are living with obesity to feel that they should avoid medications at all costs. There are options that are available in addition to providing the support so that people can still maintain that active lifestyle, to be able to have access to resources so that they are supported in their dietary habits while they're on these medications. So there's a lot of other supports we can put in place so that people living with obesity can still be on these medications in a safe way. But that all depends on communication and being open and honest with your medical provider. Okay, so that's one aspect of the conversation around drugs to treat mental health conditions. But there's also a push uh, in Congress right now uh, for something called TROA, which is the Treat and Reduce Obesity Act, and really to include anti-obesity medicines as part of that. When this came forward back in 2003, I believe, or was it 2013? I may be getting the dates uh, mixed up a little bit. There weren't a whole lot of safe drug uh, resources out there to help people living with obesity. Well, that has changed now in the years that have passed. So Dr. Bell Washington, can we talk about some of these safe drugs that may be out there that, that Medicare would hopefully cover at some point as, so that people who are covered by it might have that as an option to help them live better and thrive? Sure, excellent. Um, you are right, the TROA, um, the act is very important. We're really wanting it to get passed because it creates this huge gap um, in people who are not able to get the treatments. And as I said earlier, obesity used to be seen as a cosmetic concern. We realize it's not. So there are medications that can help and um, it's important to at least consider them as a tool in the toolbox. Um, Dr. Crawford mentioned this earlier and then I'll answer your question, but just that as, um, as we treat mental health, there are times um, that you know people gain weight on those medications, particularly antipsychotics, which get prescribed to um, some younger children when they need them. It gets pres prescribed to older adults. And you know you can wake up and a month later, you've gained 25 pounds. I've had that happen to several patients. And then wow. they are um, dismayed. They want to stop the medication. They're out of there. You know, they're thinking, I, I don't want to gain weight too. You know, I'm already having some emotional issues. I don't want to have this as a problem. And um, in my practice, what I tend to do is I look at the medications a patient's on. I decide, okay, maybe this medication is needed, but it is causing weight gain. So especially in mental health, we have other medications that can um, help with weight loss. There are some that are weight neutral, which means you can take them and hopefully um, you won't gain weight, but you may not lose weight either. And then there have some that are weight weight loss um, medications that kind of make up weight loss medications. Um, but there are four weight loss drugs that have been approved for long-term use. Um, and so we have, you know, uh, bupropion and naltrexone, that's a combo, um, sexenda. So there, there are other, and then kisemia, which is fentramine, and that one people um, got concerned because they heard of fin, fin back back in the day. But the mm -hmm. fentramine part mm -hmm. of it is, is actually the part that does not cause problems. So you can take that medication um, and the FDA may have it where you take it for a, a short period of time. But really, you can take that medication for years and not have any um, health issues result from that. So I would say if anyone is... Um, considering medication, uh, also surgery is an option that we, we didn't mention that, but you know, mm -hmm. there are many um, I, in obesity medicine association, we call them pillars. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, there are pillars of treatment, um, you know, and it's been mentioned, you want to control your stress, you want to control what you're eating and try not so much to aim for these calories, but you want to aim for the quality of your, 
your diet. So if I eat a thousand calories of jelly beans, I mean, my teeth might hurt, you know, like I, I would feel like I've eaten, but you know, very shortly after that, I'm not, I'm going to be hungry again. I'll have a, a sugar mm -hmm. crash. And then if you have a thousand calories of some healthy food, likely that would last longer. And so and I say healthy food, there are no good and bad foods, but there's some foods we should eat, you know, much less frequently. Um, and so you want to just have this balance. So you have nutrition, you have sleep, you have stress, stress needs to be controlled because it, changes your hormones and can certainly add to weight gain, weight storage, fat storage. Um, so if you're interested and then diet and, and um, also surgery options. So there are medications that are out there that are safe and um, available um, and they, and they work. So just do consider them. Dr. Hancock, I, you, you know about all of this because it all shows up in your practice. Um, but one of the things I've heard particularly during this pandemic is how overwhelmed our psychologists and psychologists are, particularly the ones who are black or people of color, because many times people want to see someone that they can identify with. So because we know that there are a lack of, of matches, so to speak, um, how do you counsel people about getting the help they need in a timely fashion? And they may want to see a Dr. Crawford or a Dr. Bell Washington, but they may not be available. So how do you remove that barrier so that people who actually need help may be able to get it regardless of whether the doctor looks like them? Right. So I think, one, it's important to put it in context when people hear how few there are just to understand the percentages. Only 5% mm -hmm. of all physicians in this country are African-American only 4% of all psychologists are African-American and only 2%, like we got a black unicorn amidst within our circle, 2% of psychiatrists look like us. And so when you think about that, mm. particularly in terms of culturally competent care, it makes it like a needle in a haystack. It's interesting to me that in order to renew my DC and my Maryland me medical license, I have to take CME on HIV, I have to take CME, continuing medical education on opioids. Okay. I have not prescribed opioids to a pediatric patient in over 10 years. I have not dealt with a child, thankfully, with HIV in the past 12 years. But every single, every two years in Maryland and every year in DC, I have to do continuing medical education on those areas. But I don't have to do a single bit of continuing medical education on nutrition, obesity, lifestyle mm. every once in a while they'll throw a little mental health in there depending on you know their their mood but when it comes to obesity i deal with that we deal with that every specialty deals with it every single day so the first thing we have mm. to do is really look at continuing medical education and the medical education system in general to incorporate basic nutrition knowledge and specifically obesity and cultural competency. It needs to be required in all curricula across, not just physicians, nurses, NPs, PAs, anyone working in health needs to have all of those areas done. Two, it's really creating for me a cadre of folks that I can go to. I have a list. Now it has grown thankfully to two pages of people I can refer. The beauty of the pandemic is now we have virtual access. So if you go to like Black Black Girls Therapy, if you go to, I think there's a Zen website, there are all these resources. NAMI has always been one of the places. I just love the fact that I'm in the space with Dr. Crawford because NAMI has been one of my go-to places for not only patients, but families to get support so that they know they can learn how to advocate for themselves, even in a space where they're dealing with a less than culturally competent physician. Because part of it is our training and us showing up collectively and the us not just being black folks, but every person who works in healthcare. But it's also equipping our families and our patients with the capacity to advocate for themselves, even when they're dealing with a racist physician, because it happens, even when they're dealing with a stigmatizing physician or other healthcare professional. So it's doing both of those things that allow us to create a space for us collectively to optimize our mental health in the same way that we focus on physical health. These are really great things to convey to the people who have joined us this afternoon. And we know that you all may have your own questions as well. And so we invite you to continue to put them in the chat because it is rare, as Dr. Hancock says, uh, to have this kind of um, 
medical power, women power who look like you in the space who can answer your questions. And, and it can be hard wherever you live to get in to see them. So we want to make sure that we utilize this time with our experts as much as we can. So go ahead and put those questions in the chat and we want to get to them uh, before our session is over. Um, so while we're getting people to, to really put those pressing questions they have in there, um, let me talk to all of you about, um, again, how you address racism and the lack of health equity um, around obesity and mental health. Um, big picture here. Um, if you're going to a physician, if I'm going to a physician and I have these concerns and I don't feel like someone's hearing me, how do I, as the patient, push for them to advocate for me? Uh, because we know there are so few of you in these spaces. The physicians we interact with may not look like you. So how do we push if we feel like there, we, we need some additional support and we're not being heard? You know, we often hear, in, in particular, Black women who've talked about they're feeling some kind of way, they express the symptoms they're having, sometimes physicians don't listen to them, and their health outcomes may be poor because of that. So we're aware, this is Minority Mental Health Month, we're dialed into how we're feeling, we may be living with obesity, or we may have concerns that we might be living with obesity. And we really want to make sure that the physician or the person that we're interfacing with is listening to us. Give us the words, give us the, the power to use when we're in that space and we want to advocate for ourselves, Dr. Crawford. I loved how you tee that up. It's so, so, such an important topic. I think what is really important for everyone to know is that the way in which you advocate for yourself and the force in which you do, do that will hopefully be met with that same level of reactivity. Oftentimes when we present concerns to people and we'll say, oh, I'm a little worried about this, then that may be conveying to the medical provider that maybe you're not as intensely worried about it, maybe it's not really an acute issue, and other matters can be addressed. But if you are very direct and clear with your medical provider about your concerns with about your obesity, then the hope is that it will be met with that same level of concern. So to say, I am very worried about my weight and I'm worried about how it's impacting my health, what can you do to help me navigate that, those challenges? Or what is it that you can provide me so that I can better support my health? And so you are communicating the concern and you're also drawing in on the expertise of that medical provider to let them know that they are on now, that you have put it on them to provide you with those supports. Because oftentimes as women, right, especially as black women, it could be this concern of, well, you, you, you know, it's, you're fine. Most black women are overweight anyways. It's, it's not a problem. If you're interested, you can look at some of these resources or do it on, on your own. But we need people to take care of ourselves, especially the people who are going to school, who are educated and paid to do so. And so we need to empower ourselves by putting this on other people so they can really supply us with those tools that may not really be in our awareness, but they have direct access to because they are specialists and they work within the space. So I strongly encourage people to empower themselves by having a voice that is strong, that is clear, that is direct, and that is unmovable. So simply stating facts and then seeing how that person responds. And if it is not met with the response that is warranted, to keep on at it, to not just walk away from that appointment and be like, well, I guess, you know, I'm not really worth there being more kind of exploration as to what's going on. You mm -hmm. keep at it. And it can be very exhausting. It can be burdensome. But we really need to put in that work to advocate for our health. Mm -hmm. How do you, Dr. Bell Washington, if someone is pushing you in your office, mm -hmm. help them to understand, okay, I got it. I'm listening to you. Um, it, 
I'm going to I'm going to assume that you all are so dialed into your patients that that has not happened with you, but you're human as well. Right. And so has there been an instance at all when someone has come into your office and pushed a little bit and maybe shifted your own thinking? That's an excellent, um, an excellent question. I would say you're correct in that I generally try my best to be very open minded and to actually listen because Again, as a psychiatrist, we have an hour with our patients often, hour and a half sometimes. And so there is a lot of time <laughs> when they're new. Uh, there's a, a lot of time to, to really get to know them and to, um, to see what is, what's on their mind, what is their concern. So what I will say is I don't necessarily have a lot of patients who, you know, sit down and have a talk like, hey, you're not hearing me. But if they did, you know, you have to humble yourself as a physician because you're human. Um, you can't know everything. You can't, uh, I can't read people's minds, even though I can kind of mm -hmm. see their emotions, you know, you have to tell me. And so if I notice that I'm in an interview with a patient and I'm kind of feeling like, oh, I don't feel like I'm getting the whole story or, you know, there seems to be something uh, that you're not saying, then sometimes even I will open it up like, hey, you know, I think that you're here for this, this, and this, um, but, you know, is there anything I'm missing? Is there something else there? You know, like, uh, did I miss something? Um, and maybe, you know, if you have a really open um, dialogue and a good rapport with that patient, they'll say, well, yeah, you didn't ask me about my sleep or, you know, um, uh, I'm worried that you think I'm not following my plan, uh, my, my eating plan, because I haven't lost weight. And I'm, then we can talk about it, because a lot of times putting it on the table, kind of um, bringing it out into the open will help um, help the patient feel more comfortable speaking about it. Um, and so that that is really what I do if I'm in a situation where I feel like there's a disconnect um, or, you know, if you feel like there's something missing, I will, I will bring them in to the um to the conversation and just say, you know, this is a joint a joint effort. I can't work harder than you. You can't work hard. You know, we have to work together. And so um, you bring what you're concerned about, and then I'll meet you. I'll meet you there. But I did want to add just really briefly, along with Dr. Crawford's um, comments again, just that um, as a so I'm a physician, but I'm also a mom of four children, ages five and under. And so in the past, um, wow. you know, several years. <laughs> Can we just stop there? Just, just you just kind of put that out there in the universe and kept going. We just need a minute to, yeah, to no, process that and just to do lot, this. Thank you, look, thank you, thank you. I, they they bring me lots of um, excitement, but you know, so I have a five year old, I have three year old twins, and I have a one year old, and so I'm saying all of that to say that I've had a lot of interaction with the medical field in the past few years because you have to go to prenatal appointments and you have, you know, you're trying to make sure you're you're not um, getting high blood pressure if you're pregnant and, you know, a black woman. And, you know, the maternity um, death rate for black women is, is abysmal. Mm -hmm. It's very bad. And so that's something to look out for. So I'll just say I've even had to practice advocating for myself because I have doctors who we know the reason, but for some reason don't believe or don't understand or don't acknowledge that I'm a doctor. I'm a physician too. So I know what they're you know, talking about. And I'll have to say, hey, you know, I'm concerned about this. And they'll say, oh, it's fine. It always happens. And I, and I, you know, I have to tell myself, I don't want to be, you know, we worry about being disrespectful or stepping on toes, but honestly, it's my health. I have to live to see another day and I'm concerned about it. Can you tell me, you know, I, I, I tell people to advocate as it's been said, why are we not treating this issue? You know, can you tell me why we're not treating this? Is it, is it concerning? And if they say no, then, okay, at what point should I be concerned? Because you have to get them to, to, um, you know, I'm, you have to get them to say it outright. You know, okay, um, I've gained, let's say I've gained 10 pounds and you're telling me don't worry about it. I think it's coming from this medicine. When should I come back? How much weight should I expect to lose if I stop it? Can we try something else? So be sure mm -hmm. to advocate for yourself. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking to your doctor because there are some people with trouble with racism and there are all sorts of structural problems where they may not have these personal opinions, but the system is set up to kind of lead you towards ill health um, at different times, then find another doctor. It may not be a black doctor, but you can find someone else. So get a second opinion, advocate, and just realize that we're all kind of in the struggle trying to get to better health. So, um, you know, your doctor may understand if you call them out, but if they don't, they're other doctors. So feel, feel comfortable finding someone who can advocate and um, also meet you there. That's great, great advice from you and from Dr. Crawford. Dr. Hancock, I wonder if you could give us a template for, uh, a healthy life. 
If we're thinking about a daily checklist about our mental health, about whether we are feeling good in our skin, whether we think we might be living with obesity or whether we have concerns about our weight, we're going through our day. What's our daily checklist to make sure we're okay? What are some action items? What kinds of questions should we be answering daily to ensure that we're good, we're okay, or we know that we need to seek out assistance to get to that better place? Well, I think it's important for us to, first, that question is is excellent because you want people to be able to walk away with some, with some takeaways. The first thing is to really assess where you are in various domains of health. So when you get up in the morning, how am I feeling physically? How am I feeling emotionally? How am I feeling mentally? How am I feeling spiritually? How am I feeling financially? Am I worried that that check is not going to clear that I wrote last week? Like, what is all that happening? What is my relational health looking like? What is my professional health looking like? And then what are the things that we're going to do to navigate what there may be challenges and how are we going to celebrate those victories? And so when I get up in the morning, I'll talk you through what I do. I wake up in the morning, I do a body check. Is my head hurting because I have a history of migraines? Am I, is my head hurting? Do I need a couple more Zs? Do I, do I have the luxury of sleeping a little bit longer if I'm not feeling well? What does my schedule look like to give me some flexibility? I get up in the morning, I pray and I meditate. And then I go to the gym. So I get my physical activity in. You don't have to go to a gym. Throughout the pandemic, I figured out how to work out at home. I even got yoga certified so that I could not only be able to exercise myself, but to also provide that resource to my community. So what does your day look like in terms of the opportunity to have some form of physical activity? What is going to be your planned downtime? You know, we always say that if we, if we fail to plan, we plan to fail. So we want to think through what does my day look like? And this, what I want you to do is think about it ahead of time. Don't wait till the day of. This should be something that we start working towards, striving towards. What am I eating today? Because particularly for a lot of us who are super, super busy, we skip meals. We get so involved in everything that we're doing that we will sacrifice self for everything else. So while, you know, while we're on a break, I'm rushing in here to make myself a little sandwich so that I have something to eat in between my patients. What does your bedtime look like? I will be fully transparent. Sleep is my Achilles heel. I will try to get so much in in a day that I will sacrifice sleep. And then it ends up biting you in the behind later. It does impact your mental health. It impacts your relational health, your all the domains, right? So being very specific, if I drink sugary drinks, and I just heard on this panel that sugar is one of the foods that can alter mood, which is critical. People just do not fully understand how important food is in terms of mood. Food can deplete your dopamine and serotonin hormones, which are your mood stabilizing hormones. They can take them up and crash them way back down. The food that you eat, particularly fats, can impact how sensitive your body is to dopamine and serotonin. Dealing with obesity can facilitate certain food choices. Medications can, can facilitate food choices. So it's knowing all of that and making conscious decisions about what I will do for myself what I will do for my family. I have a nine-year-old daughter and the decisions that I make every single day, I keep her in mind. I put myself first, which is what I've taught her to do. You put yourself first, you put your oxygen mask on first. And then I figure out what does my daughter's day look like in order to optimize her health. If we take the time to be very, very purposeful and present in each and every health decision that we make, that's what's going to allow us to achieve better mental, physical, emotional health, all of those areas of health. But when we just go blindly, and it's easy for us to do, we get so caught up in the, the, the practice of life that we forget about the presence of life. And when we become more present with every decision, like how I said, health is in all policy, health is in every single decision that we make, even in voting. So when you make a, when you vote this year, think about your health, the health of your family and the health of your community. Before I let you go, that's great. Last word, Dr. Crawford, Dr. Bell Washington, and Dr. Hancock. One thing you should do during this Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. To pause and reflect. We heard about how we're always on the go, but we need to slow things down 
reflect on what it is that we're doing and how it is that we're doing it so that we can make sure that we're taking care of our overall health. Perfect. Dr. Bell Washington? I would suggest that everyone spend some time journaling or praying and also get outdoors. So that's two things, but I think those are both, both very helpful. And Dr. Hancock. Don't forget our babies when we talk about mental health. Check in on your children. Don't ask them closed-ended questions. Give them a way to measure out how they're doing. I asked my daughter, what, how, tell me about the highlight of your day. Discuss for, with me the challenge of your day so that I can help her through emotionally and socially what she's dealing with. Those are perfect words to end this by, Dr. Christine Crawford, Dr. Tiffany Bell Washington, and Dr. Yolandra Hancock. Thank you for your time, but mostly thank you for your heart. We all receive it in the spirit in which it was given this afternoon, and we hope that all of you who have joined us now and may be joining us later to take in this afternoon's session, um, receive all of what our doctors share today in the spirit that they shared it. So thank you for being here. Thank you for pausing for a moment to be present. We hope this has been insightful for you. The webinar will remain on YouTube. So if the information you received has been helpful, feel free to share it. Feel free to come back to it. Feel free to rewind back to that part that you missed that you want to make sure that you are intentional about. On behalf of the Women's Black Women's Health Imperative, Healthy Women, and of course, our sponsor, Novo Nordisk. We thank you for being part of our Reclaim Your Wellness campaign. Please visit reclaimyourwellness.org to sign up to be notified for future events. Have a great day, have a healthy day, and we hope to see you the next time.